Good morning, dear friends. <clears throat> I hope that you had a good night's sleep and uh, are ready for the day. It's going to be a beautiful day. It's already um, starting to, to be awesome. Um, as I was coming into work this morning, I put on my um, my son's uh, music. It's so energizing and um, very powerful, very uh, spirit-led music, and I was really enjoying that. So I always feel good when I when I get a little dose of any sort of praise music or any sort of uh, music that just really uh, sets my mind on the Lord. And so um, as stressful as the drive-in is on I-35, it is also um, really a good, a good thing because I'm able to just um, think about the things of the Lord and think about the day. And maybe you've already started that as well with your cup of coffee. And if you haven't, there's still plenty of time to do that. So, all right. So we have Leslie, Jan and Larry, Stacy, Christy, Amy, Joe. Good to see you guys this morning. And there may be others of you on um, that just haven't commented. Good morning to you too. I don't want to leave anybody's name out. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got some great readings for today. Um, the first one is from Lion Bites. Good morning, Bobby. Uh, and good morning, Janet. I don't know if I said Janet earlier, but good morning to you too. All right, we are on page 37 in Lion Bites by Emma Stark. And it says, the title of this is, I Have Not Forgotten You, Part 1. We start with Isaiah 43, 1 through 2, and it says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Father God says to you, trust me and do not be afraid. It may seem to you like you are the mo in the most challenging and darkest time of your life. I know that you're tempted to feel that I have forgotten you, but know that I do not lose sight of the virtual truth that I will sustain you through this trial. Allow me to comfort you in your present situation. Remember that I will be with you, whatever happens. You know this truth already by actually sensing my presence and experiencing comfort it brings is something very different altogether. <clears throat> Years ago, King David wrote that my presence filled him with joy as he took hold of my hand and I led him along the path of life. That's from Psalm 1611. I will do the same for you. My presence will take away your fear when you feel that you are in over your head and the waters of life are very rough around you. You will not drown. That's Isaiah 43, 2. Many people find enormous comfort in Psalm 23, especially the lines in verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. I will not be afraid. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You walk beside me and I feel secure. There is a nearness to God that David experienced when he felt troubled or distressed. And you can know it too. Read the book of Ruth and learn all that Naomi went through. Just as God was with her, he is there for you as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So this idea of not fearing as we go through the trials of life, maybe some folks are really um, stressing out these days just because of all of the insecurities that are around us. Um, there are a, a lot of people who have trouble putting food on the table to feed their family uh, day by day. Um, there are people that are struggling to keep a roof over their head. There are some people who have been moved out of their um, places of, um, you know, the, the places that they live and are now living in their car because they didn't have the money for all the deposits. They didn't have all that they needed and their rent way, went way up and they couldn't afford it and they got they got evicted. There's a lot of hardship in our world around us and it's real easy um, to watch the news and to get depressed. Some of us turn the news off 
and we just choose to not look at it, but that doesn't mean that the trouble's not there. And I think that because we are so connected with other people that we sense that trouble, even when we do try to put our head in the sand and not acknowledge what's going on. Um, this is where we just put our trust in the Lord and we let him take care of us. We trust him for each moment. And I have watched God do great miracles in people's lives, provide for them in ways when they were just at that 11th hour and desperate, and yet something happens and, and, and God comes through. We have to trust him. And it's hard when it's the 11th hour for sure. And I know each one of us have probably experienced that at some point in our life. But God is so good, and he tells us over and over in Scripture, as I just read several passages, I mean several verses, um, that tell us we're not to fear, we're not to worry. So today, we just we just look at what's right in front of us, and we do the very best we can with what God has given us, and we're faithful to him, and we leave the rest up to him. And when we have that sort of focus on him and on not worrying about everything around us, then we are less panicky and we are able to just move forward and do the things that we need to do for the day. Oh Lord, let our souls rise up to meet you just as the day rises to meet the sun. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen and amen. All right, so let's turn to Psalm 119, starting in verse 137 today. And it says, the, the, um, O Lord, you are righteous and your regulations are fair. Your laws are perfect and completely trustworthy. I am overwhelmed with indignation for my enemies have disregarded your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested. That is why I love them so much. I am insignificant and despised, but I don't forget your commandments. Your justice is eternal, and your instructions are perfectly true. As pressure and stress bear down on me, I find joy in your commands. Your laws are always right. Help me to understand them so I may live. So there was a couple of things that I kind of marked when I read this earlier. The first one was verse 139, and it says, I am overwhelmed with indignation, for my enemies have disregarded your words. To me, that sounds like we're getting in somebody else's business. Um, but when I reread it and, um, and uh, just thought about it, I think it's this, uh, we want everybody to experience what we experience finding comfort in the scripture. And so that's part of our testimony, right? We go out and we share that when we when we encounter people that are going through a hard time. It's very comforting to share scripture. Even people who do not go to church on a regular basis, um we have been out in restaurants before and when we offer a prayer or someone with us offers a prayer, um, for the server, because we can tell that the server's having a rough time. Maybe we've seen another customer mistreating the person, or they've got some sort of look on their face. And just to say, you know, Jesus loves you. And I hope that you know that. Or to say a word of scripture that tries to encourage them, or to pray a prayer over them. Um, that's what I get the sense there. Overwhelmed with indignation for my enemies have disregarded your word. They haven't they they have disregarded the word because they don't know what comfort it brings. And that's it's up to us to share that with them. Because a lot of them are not raised in churches, or maybe they went to church when they were young, but they have since turned away, or you know, life got in the way and they just kind of, you know, let it happen. And so um, so that was one verse that really stood out to me. The other one was 143 where it says, as pressure and stress bears down on me, I find joy in your commands. And I was immediately, immediately drawn to Psalm 121. Psalm 121 for me has been popping up a lot. I preached about it on Sunday because it just kept popping up and it was such words of comfort and it fit so nicely with that sermon. And so I continue to hear these words. And so I just 
will tell you, verse 1 and 2 says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. If the God who made heaven and earth can do all that he's done, can't he handle our problems? Can't he handle the things that we bring to him that seem monumental to us, but yet they are nothing for the Lord? So he wants to help us. So um, so I was really drawn to that passage. And when I when I read this, I see this encouragement that we get from the scripture. That's what Psalm 119 is about. It's been about um, helping us draw fences around our life, you know, or, or realizing that there are fences that we can live in that keep us safe. But it's also pointing us to the fact that when we need encouragement, the scripture is there for just uh, such a time. Let's go to Job chapter 21, starting in verse 1. And it said, Then Job spoke again. Listen closely to what I am saying. That's one consolation you can give me. Bear with me and let me speak. After I have spoken, you may resume mocking me. I love that. He's got such a sense of humor, doesn't he? My complaint is with God, not with people. I have good reason to be so impatient. Look at me and be stunned. Put your hand over your mouth in shock. When I think about what I am saying, I shudder. My body trembles. Why do the wicked prosper, growing old and powerful? They live to see their children grow up and settle down and enjoy their grandchildren. Their homes are safe from every fear and God does not punish them. Their bulls never fail to breed. Their cows bear calves and never miscarry. They let their children risk. They let their children frisk about like lambs. Their little ones skip and dance. They sing with tambourine and harp. They celebrate to the, to the sound of the flute. They sound their days in prosperity and then go down to the grave in peace. And yet they say to God, go away. We want no part of you in your ways. Who is the Almighty and why should we obey him? What good will it do us to pray? They think their prosperity is of, of their own doing, but I will have nothing to do with that kind of thinking. Yet the light of the wicked never seems to be extinguished. Do they ever trouble? Does God distribute sorrows to them in anger? Are they driven before the wind like straw? Are they carried away by the storm like chaff? Not at all. So, okay, remember yesterday, Zophar was talking about how um, bad things happen to the to folks as a result of their unrighteousness. And Job is now refuting that and he's saying, no, that's not true. Bad things happen to good people and bad things happen to people who are unrighteous. There the, also, on the other hand, um, good, uh, the, okay, I just lost my train of thought. Good and bad happens to both righteous and unrighteous. How about that? I'll sum it up instead of trying to confuse myself. And so, um, it, it does, it's not a, whether we're pros, uh, prosperous, whether we have a life just go so very smoothly, uh, which I haven't known anybody that's really ever had that happen. Um, I used to think I knew people and then, and then things happened in their life. And it was like, all of a sudden, everything tumped upside down. So I, I, to this day, I don't know anybody that has gone through life without any troubles or just smooth sailing. But it can happen, you know, the prosperity and the good things as well as the bad things happen to all of us. And so it is not a, a judgment call about whether we're righteous or we're unrighteous. And that's what Job was trying to say is that he was being mocked um, by something that wasn't even true. And he knew what was going on. He knew that this, that God does what God wants to do and God allows what God allows. And he's the one that knows why, um, why this happens. And what we have to do is we just have to trust. 
If we know that God loves us and we believe what the Bible says, that he's going to take care of us, that he's always working things out for our good, even using the, the really difficult things in life. If we know that about God, then we can trust him. We can trust that when we go through things, that he's going to be there to help us. And we don't have to base it upon ourselves as if we have caused something. Now, that's not to say that we don't sometimes suffer consequences as the result of some of the things we do, but we kind of know that, right? We know, okay, well, this is a direct result of my getting off the path and rebelling and doing my own thing, and now this has happened. But the things that are beyond our control, it's not, it's not, it doesn't happen just because we're righteous or we're unrighteous. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it's good for us to differentiate between the two, you know, knowing very well that there are things that we do that cause, that have certain causes, but then there's other things that just happen because they happen because we live in a world that is not perfect. Um, and, and there are just things that are going to happen. And in those times we just trust the Lord. Um, we, I think people waste a whole lot of energy sometimes and myself included worrying about all of these things that we don't have any control over. And if we don't have any control over, then why waste the energy? Cause that energy can be better spent serving the Lord. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 22, starting in verse 30. It says the next day, the commander ordered the leading priests into session with the Jewish high council. He wanted to find out what the trouble was all about, so he released Paul to have him stand before them. Gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Instantly, Ananias the high priest commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. But Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you? to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that. Those standing near Paul said to him, do not dare insult God's high priest. I am sorry, brothers. I didn't realize he was the high priest, Paul replied, for the scriptures say you must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Paul realized that some members of the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. And so he shouted, brothers, I am a Pharisee as were my ancestors, and I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This divided the council, the Pharisees against the Sadducees, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all of these. So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully. They see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. As the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. That night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul, just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem. You must preach the good news in Rome as well. So we know from yesterday's reading that Paul was um, arrested by the Romans and he said, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't do this. Um, and then, you know, it's it kind of set everybody uh, into a tizzy because they didn't realize what was what was going on. But now Paul stands before the high council and he testifies. And for those of you who are here at First Christian Church United, this past weekend, we looked at, at uh, Luke 21 uh, verses 5 through 19. And in that passage, it talks about how you're going to be persecuted. These were Jesus's own words. You'll be persecuted. There will be bad things that will happen. Um, but I will not let one hair on your head be harmed. And I was drawn back to that passage because here in, in Paul's case, he's standing up. He knows that, you know, his life is being threatened, but yet he continues to witness. That was another part of that Luke passage is use all of these circumstances of your life 
to be a witness. Um, don't let it be about us. Oh, poor pitiful me. Look at what I'm going through. That's not what Paul did. Paul used it as an opportunity to witness. He said, this is what I believe. I, you know, this is my history. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a Pharisee. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in a long line of Pharisees. I'm just like you are. But I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And it's an opportunity for, for people to hear the uh, truth about Jesus. Now, you notice what happens among these religious leaders is suddenly there's division. The same thing happens today. Um, we have it in denominations. If you're, if you are aware at all, you know, that denominations like the Methodist church, for example, right now is, it is in a, a, a process of dividing into parts and it's dividing over, um, you know, there's a group that's more social progressive, more social justice kind of minded. There's another group that wants to hold true to the, to, um, the scripture as, and to the tradition and to all of that. And, and then there's a whole nother group, um, that, that takes it even a step further. And so there's all this division. And that's what I see here with the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that they're dividing along theological lines and it's causing a tizzy. It's because the truth was spoken. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And, um, and even that is an issue today. So what I get from this is that we, we have, um, something very firm to stand on a firm foundation is scripture. And when we stand on that scripture as it is, not as we want it to be, but as it is, then, um, God is the one that kind of, you know, has to work on everybody else's heart. We just stand on the truth and we let our witness be a witness regardless of what the consequences will be. Um, it's hard to do, hard to do. There's a lot of people that get into more popularity things, I think, than truth, but, um, that's, that's another discussion for another day. All right. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I have a couple of additional prayers. I see Tim's on with us this morning and, uh, Tim, we are praying for you. Um, I heard yesterday that you had a little procedure. We're praying that you are well, that you're not feeling pain, that you're recovering. Um, and, uh, we're glad to, to see you on this morning. Um, and I want to say good morning to, to Barb, Gustina, Chuck, great to have you on this morning and, uh, Jack. So, all right. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, we have the Ammons that, uh, Carl Ammon, that's got a lot of congestion and upper respiratory. We want to pray for him. Linda Neff fell last week and hurt her leg. Um, and she's having a hard time, even after several days of icing, bending the leg and all of that. So we pray for her. We pray for Rose Turner, um, who hyperextended her knee and she's having a lot of pain in her legs. So we pray for her. We pray for her mobility issues. Um, and, um, we, we continue to lift up, um, the others that we have been praying for, um, all along for Bernadette. Peggy is out with her mom now, or I think she left this morning. Um, so we want to pray for safe travel and we pray for her as she cares for her mom and that whole process of trying to get her mom into a place where it's safe and where she's taken care of that we, the, any of you who have been through that know that that's very difficult. So we pray for her and also, um, for a couple, Tammy and Denny Wynn, um, they have got some strains and struggles with some family members. So they need a lot of comfort today. Um, those of us who have gone through that know the pain, uh, when your children, um, are standing in a different circle than you are. And so we just pray for, for them and their daughter and their grandchildren. All right. And then I want to pray for Christy as well. Christy, um, told me that she has having some neck issues. So Christy, we're praying for you as well. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, 
We just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've provided. We thank you for the opportunity to get into your word and to be able to be encouraged, but also to think about things like our witness and and do we have courage to stand up the way that Paul stood up to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, knowing that it could very well cost him his life. But Lord, he loved you and he his priority was you, and that is obvious in his responses and in his actions. And I pray, Lord, that we will have that same love and that same dedication for you. And we ask, Lord, that you will help us to get out of ourselves, to recognize that we live this life for you, that we are here, we are put on this earth to glorify you. We are put on this earth to testify. And um, so many times, Lord, we get our priorities backwards. We we worry about providing. We worry about um, the things that we want to worry about. But yet our faith and our testimony take a back seat. And so, Father, I pray that you would just shake us up and that you would just uh, help us to to reorder our priorities so that you are always first. We thank you, Lord, for the ways that in which you are working and healing. We thank you, Lord, that you are already at work at healing our friends who have who have had falls and who have leg issues, have mobility issues, have family issues. Those who are grieving, those who are just struggling right now, Lord, struggling with things internally, struggling with the things around them, struggling with their own um, personal lives of of uh, provision and protection. Father, you are our God. You are our Father, our Abba Father, and you love us with all that you have, so much so that you sent your Son. Help us to stand firm on that truth and help it to shape our lives and what we do. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Lord, keep us from following the gods of pride, stubbornness, vanity, sloth, greed, and comfort that beckon for our allegiance every day. You brought us through the night watches, you who neither slumber nor sleep. We pray to follow you along the paths of generosity, humility, and love throughout this day. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may lead you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he will show you. May he bring you home rejoicing right back here Friday morning. Until then, everyone, have a wonderful couple of days, and I'll see you Friday. Bye.